Well, we come in this present study to the end of the book of John. And last week when we were ending up the class, I noticed again what a passage of scripture that I've certainly quoted a lot. And it serves as the purpose of the book of John. That is the purpose of the apostle John in writing the book. I would like for us to begin this by going back over those last two verses of John chapter 30, or rather 20. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you might have life through his name. The emphasis is, at this point, before we go into verse uh, chapter 21, is through his name. I've taken time off and on throughout the book to emphasize that through his name indicates an avenue. Uh, through his name means through the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what uh, Peter and John and the rest of the apostles on the day of Pentecost would have told the people who were convicted of their sins by the gospel and wanted to be forgiven of their sins and be pleasing to God. They were told to be baptized in the name of Christ. It wouldn't do any more to say, well, I'm a child of God because I have, I'm a fleshly descendant of Abraham through Jacob. That wouldn't do any more. And of course, Jesus began to prepare them for that as we studied in John chapter 3 when he dealt with Nicodemus. I think it's good to remind ourselves that all these particular witnesses that John by inspiration had brought forth besides his own testimony must have been brought forth over and over again in different ways by many different people uh, as we'll see toward the end of this last chapter chapter 21 we'll simply call it the epilogue as we have fresh in our mind the purpose John had in mind for writing the book in the first place and what was it? Well, we've reiterated this all the way through the study of the book. It's to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world. And as was quoted by Ken a moment ago, John 14, 6, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Notice again, now this is from the book of John itself, which we studied earlier, and that one gets quoted very many times. So we come now to this 21st chapter, and we can call it the epilogue if you want to. Uh, we see that he begins the chapter, which remember there were no chapters or verses in the original document. But he says, after these things, after the things we just talked about, uh, Jesus is going to appear to um, the apostles. And this takes place in the first 14 verses of chapter 21. And as I've said time and time again, hope you'll make it a practice to do so in any of your studies that you read for yourself the verses word for word. And then when we hit the high points here or the facts emphasizing them, it'll mean more to you. This third appearance of the Lord is to, again, his apostles. Some of them. Uh, they were at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the same as the Sea of Galilee. Tiberius was the emperor of Rome during the earthly ministry of Christ and through his death and resurrection. Uh, following Tiberius would be one of the, uh, I mean, among a whole host of corrupted, wicked people would be one of the worst, and that would be Caligula. The disciples that were present at the time of his uh, third appearance were Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, 
who was of Cana of Galilee, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and then we have mentioned two other disciples. I think it's interesting the way this starts out. Uh, Simon Peter just simply says, I'm going fishing. That's always sort of made me chuckle right in the middle of all these events, uh, all this transpired. Uh, I'm going fishing. Well, they were fishermen by trade. You'll remember that. Uh, James and John and Zebedee, their father. They were all from Galilee. Now you'll notice they're not in Jerusalem anymore. They've traveled back north to Galilee. They would probably be more familiar surroundings to them. They wouldn't be in such a hotbed of trouble that came about due to the crucifixion of Christ, the events immediately following it. So he goes fishing. Well, the others say, we'll go with you. And they went out into the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias, and they fished all night long, but they didn't catch a thing. Along about the time the sun was coming up, by the time day was breaking, Jesus is standing over on the beach. And the disciples saw somebody on the beach, but they didn't know at that point that it was Jesus. Then Jesus cries out to them, which tells you they weren't that far from the beach, and says, um, you know, have you caught any fish? Actually, the creek sort of is, uh, you don't have any fish, do you? It's, it's that kind of thing. Uh, of course, he knew one way or the other, but that's for their benefit. And they answered him in the negative. No, we haven't. But then Jesus said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll catch fish. Well, they did as they were told, still without any idea this is Jesus. They cast it the right side of the boat, and they caught a great number of fish. Then John says to Peter, it is the Lord. Simon, still impetuous Simon, when he hears this, he gathers up his outer garment and he jumps overboard. He tells you it wasn't maybe too deep. And he heads for the shore. He didn't have time, I guess we'd say, to wait for the boat. Then the other disciples followed him in the boat. So they weren't far from land. I don't know how far it would be. It doesn't make any difference, but it wasn't like out in the middle of the thing. Pretty good sized lake. And as they came in the boat, and Peter forgotten all about this, I suppose, they came dragging the net with all the fish in it. I believe the text says they had something like 153 fish. Well, when they when they got on the land, well, here they find a, a, a fire with coals burning. It's just right for cooking. It's already set and laid out. Fish placed on the fire. They even have some bread to eat. And so Jesus said, you know, bring, bring some of the fish that you've caught. Now, Peter goes up and draws the net to land because they had to get on the boat to draw the net and so on. They brought in the land. I said earlier that uh, the net was full of fish, but they weren't just minnows. They were large fish. And I think I said that there was 153, and I believe that's correct. And um, that's a large number of fish for that place, especially when you think about they'd worked all night long. It caught nothing. And the scripture emphasizes the net wasn't even torn. Well, they take care of that, and then it's time to eat breakfast. And Jesus said to them, come and eat. It's interesting, the scripture says, John records, none of them asked who he was. They all knew who he was. This is the third time he's appeared to them. 
So Jesus comes and he takes bread and gave them the same and fish likewise. And the scripture just says this is now the third time that Jesus manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So that's an interesting account. It also says that Jesus and his fleshly body would eat. And it would be the same body they saw him in back when they saw him in Jerusalem. And now we come to an interesting thing, uh, verses 15 through 19. It's interesting to watch how Jesus deals with Simon Peter. I think you can see him dealing uh, kindly and gently with him. And so after they've eaten, their breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, <clears throat> Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? In other words, you, do you love me more than these others love me? Now, here's where it gets interesting in going back to the original language. Our Lord, as you will, well, you first of all, you know in Greek there's four words used for love. They mean a different kind of love. One of them, sexual love, doesn't even appear in the scriptures. The idea does, but the word itself doesn't. The highest form of love is for God so love the world. That's agapeo. And here he used that same word when he says, Simon, do you love me? Agapeo. He's asking about degree of love. That tells me something. I can love the Lord, but I can grow stronger in my love for the Lord. I can be weak in my love for the Lord. So if that's not the case, why do you have 1 Corinthians 13? Obviously, the people in church of Corinth need to grow. They need to grow in love. But here, that's Jesus that uses this Really, it's the highest form of love in the Greek language. It always seeks another's highest good. So Simon says, and it gets interesting here. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but Peter didn't use agapao. Peter used the word phileo in its proper form. And then he says, you tend my lambs. Well, the second time, Jesus says, Simon, do you love me? And our Lord again uses the word agapao. And ask about whether or not there is present in Peter love in the sense of this word. He's putting Peter to the test. Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But now Peter, again, does not use agapao. He uses phileo. And that's an intense, close friendship type relationship. If you want to see it exemplified in the Old Testament, you can. By David and his phileo love for Jonathan and vice versa. Jonathan being the son of Saul. King Saul. Well, then he says, um, you feed my sheep. That is, the Lord says to Peter. But then a third time, the Lord says, Simon, son, Jonah, do you love me? Now, this is grieving. This is rubbing Peter pretty hard. And here the Lord changes to the word that Peter uses. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me even in the sense you claim you do? Phileo. That's one reason you have the scripture saying Peter was grieved because the Lord said to him the third time, do you love me? In other words, do you love me as much as you say you do love me? Peter recognized the difference in those terms. Then he does something, it's almost like an exasperation. Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know 
that I love you. And Peter again uses the word phileo. And he tells him again, you tend my sheep. Now I want to talk about this just for a minute because here we see Jesus who certainly was close to Peter. Peter, James, and John were on the inner circle among human beings of the disciples that were closest to the Lord. Peter often, as he did when he jumped out of the boat, or as he did when he came to the tomb, John could outrun him, but John wouldn't go in, but Peter ran right in. As he did when he confessed, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God, so on and so forth. He was very impetuous. We often say, maybe it's used more than it should be, but he was a diamond in the rough. But the point I want to make is, is look how the Lord worked with him. This is the same Lord that stood in the temple and said to the Pharisees, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, your generation of vipers. Well, that's pretty scathing. Look how he deals with Peter. Same Lord. What's drawing from the Lord the response he makes to Peter? And what was drawing from the Lord the response he made to the Pharisees in the temple is the differences in the hearts of both people. Those people in the temple, such as the chief priests, the scribes, and Pharisees, they were not about to be taught. They weren't hungry and thirsting after righteousness. They were interested in establishing their own righteousness and having their way and killing the Lord and getting him out of the way because he was a stone in their way. But that's not Peter. And when you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, that's not Peter anywhere in there. Peter is uh, in that way like King David of old. He was a man after God's own heart. A person who was teachable. Oh, he made some blunders, but he was teachable. Never any doubt where Peter stood when it came to the Lord. Never any doubt about his faith in God, faith in Christ. But he was a human being. And he would make mistakes even as he would years later. When um, he failed and was drawing himself from Gentile Christians, when Jews came down to Jerusalem to Antioch, Syria, he pulled himself away and wouldn't eat with them. He who wrote 1 Corinthians 13, which stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So we can learn a lot here about how the Lord's going to deal with you and me. We can either be dealt with by the Lord like he did the Pharisees because we're like them. Or we can blunder around at times because we're human beings in the flesh, but be very zealous for the cause of the Lord. Be very concerned for the truth. In other words, if you make mistakes, you're making them because you're wanting to do right. There's a big difference in a person who makes mistakes doing their best to do what's right and the person who either doesn't care or they make mistakes because they're running the other way just as hard as they can. I heard it said one time, because when we die, and many have, we may die very young, middle age or old. Some of us may know we have a disease that's going to kill us in a matter of time, and others of us may not know about our death till it happens in some violent way. But the difference in a person who loses his soul and the person who's Save eternally. Is which direction are you going when you die? Question, which direction was Peter going when he was talked to by the Lord? And which direction were the Pharisees and the chief priests going? There's no doubt about it. But both made mistakes. But what's the difference in them? Same difference as uh, King David and King Saul. They wanted to do right, and they were willing to repent of sins when they saw it. 
That was their disposition of heart and outlook on life. And Jesus dealt with Peter in this way. After all, remember, it was Peter who boasted, though they all leave you, I won't. Of course, Jesus said that before the cock grows, you're going to deny me three times, and he did. All this was heavy on Peter's mind here. It had to be. Well, Jesus continued to uh, talk to Peter. And he says, now, when, when you're young, you gird yourself. Now, you got to remember how they wore their stuff, kind of flowing clothes they had. And you'll walk wherever you want to go. But when you grow old, yeah, I thought about that a lot of times. At least people knew he was going to grow old. When you think about James, brother of John, he never made it that far, but he stretched the imagination. Herod killed him with the sword right early on after the church was established. But at least he says, when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands. Someone else will gird you. They'll take you where you don't want to go. And the Lord said this, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. Well, it's still a very um, vague way for them at that time as far as knowing exactly what would happen. Now, as far as the death of Peter's concerned, we don't have any inspiration that tells us exactly. We only have a tradition that says that Peter was crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified upright because that was the way the Lord was crucified and he was unworthy to be crucified the same way the Lord was. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. Well, that's tradition. But the big thing he says right here is follow me. Follow me. Have you ever tried to follow somebody? Just a trail or walking through the woods or the pasture, down the street, just follow them. I know at times when you're following along, if you don't pay attention, they'll stop and you'll run right into them. Or you're following along and you're talking to somebody and next thing you know, they've turned into a store and you walk by and you say, well, where'd they go? Especially in crowded streets or something like that. To follow somebody means you must give close attention to where they're going. And our Lord has blazed the trail from earth to heaven. And that trail is in his authoritative word. And that's the reason people who do not, in general, respect properly constituted authority certainly aren't apt to respect the authority of the infallible and all-sufficient final and complete revelation of God to man, the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. They don't see the need of studying to show themselves approved unto God. Workmen that needed not to be ashamed Right to divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 15. Well, I don't know how we can follow closely Jesus and not understand his will. I don't know how we're going to learn his will if we don't listen to his word. We don't study his word. And I don't know how we study it properly if we don't learn how to ascertain his authority from his word. Or, in other words, as Paul said to Timothy, handle a right, a right and divine word of truth. It was said tonight, I think, uh, by Brother Ken, uh, that it takes diligence in the study of the Bible. And that's what I had translated in the American Standard, Standard Version of 2 Timothy 2.15, give diligence. And also we find give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And so that's what we do. Follow me, Jesus said. I don't want to follow anybody else. Of course, he's talking about spiritual matters. He's talking about religious matters. He's talking about moral matters. And you look at what's going on in these various campuses today. Why, the truth of the matter is, the United States will be far better off than none of those universities existed. They're nothing but hotbeds of challenging the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the infallibility of the scriptures, challenging the idea of truth and what truth is. 
Well, parents have the final responsibility to God for how their children are taught and reared. You can't say, well, I send them to the best school. You need to ask the question, what's the best school? I made sure this and I made sure that. Well, did you make sure they were being taught the truth? The very nature of truth. Because there's plenty of people out there that are going to do otherwise. And I tell you, as surely as you're hearing me now, that's exactly what schools of higher education are doing for the most part. They're not leading people down to understand that truth is objective and absolute and humanly attainable. Does it change whether you're old or young, rich or poor, or what ethnic background you are? You know, the truth of the gospel is the same to an Arab as it is to a Jew, or to you, or to me. It doesn't make any difference what ethnicity you are. Truth is truth is truth, and always will be truth, regardless of what people think of it or say about it or do with it. It is just that way. That's not being taught today, not being taught at all. And so we need to be mindful of that. How hard is that to teach our own children by example before they ever leave the home and by teaching them those things that needs to be ingrained in them if we're to be properly reared in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So these things are very important. I think it would be good to realize that though it does not say it here explicitly, can you imagine the kind of upbringing Peter and John and the other apostles had in their homes concerning the Old Testament scriptures? They had the wherewithal to recognize Jesus Christ and the integrity of heart to recognize their own shortcomings and change. So follow me. Well, Peter turned around, saw John following them. Peter said, Lord, what, what about this man? Jesus said, well, I want him to remain till I come. Well, what's that to you? You follow me. Great lesson there. Time is getting close right now. But I want to emphasize it. Uh, there's Brother Kenneth Cone. What about this man? Well, echo comes down from Jesus to me. You follow me. There's Brother James Arline. There's all the rest of them. And I say, well, what about them? Now, what's, going to Jesus say? what's he going to say? Well, what did he say here? You follow me. You tend to your business and you submit to my authority and you will be what you ought to be to yourself, your family, and everybody else. John explains, therefore, the saying went out among the brethren that uh, that disciple who John himself would not die. Now that sounds about like brethren. That gives me some encouragement when I realize that people were the same then they are now and always will be. There's nothing in what Jesus said to him that John uh, would not die. But they jumped to conclusions, not warranted by the evidence. So Jesus didn't say that he would not die, but if I, if, if, if I want him to remain until I come, was that you? In other words, what business is that of yours? You have a, a job to fulfill. And there's no reason to be concerned about anything but your responsibility. And if you if you fulfill your individual personal responsibility to me, you will be what you ought to be to everybody else. Then we have the closing testimony in the last verse. John says, this is that same disciple. He bears witness of these things. He wrote these things. His witness is true. And John further says, and there's also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail in this book, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books which were written. This is the reason I say that what we have selected in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially John, are just a few of the things that Jesus went about doing all day long, every day for over three years. So we come to the end of the study of John. 
and we hope it's been helpful in this bit of a survey. And before we go, we will have another word of prayer. Thank you. Our Father in heaven, we come to thee once again, thankful that we could have this time together to study thy word, to meditate on our own lives, a lot of it, to be mindful of our duty to thee. We pray thou wilt be with us throughout the night, for whatever time we have left on this earth. May we seek first thy kingdom and thy righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. Defeat us in all things that are against thee, and raise us up in that which is good. Help us to be correctable. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.